My name is Cade Courtley, and this is Can You Survive This Podcast. The show is designed to teach you techniques that will increase your chances of survival if you happen to find yourself or your family in any life-threatening disaster scenario imaginable. Each episode will put you smack in the middle of a new disaster scenario as I challenge my guests to see if they have what it takes to get out alive. Knowledge is power, people. Can you survive this podcast? My fellow survivors, if you can hear my voice, you are still alive, and as always, it is my mission to keep it that way. I'm Cade Courtley, and welcome to another episode of Can You Survive This Podcast? Amazing guest today. So if I was to ask you, name who this is, they've been featured in dozens of TV and film projects, they've done thousands of stunts, this person has doubled some of the biggest talent in the business and has also been stunt coordinator for arguably the biggest director in Hollywood right now. And if you were to say, I think his name is, I'd say, eh. her name is Zoe Bell. Zoe, welcome to the show. Thank you. What a great intro. I might have to keep that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. I had a whole, Zoe, I had a whole game plan for oh, this yeah. interview. Uh-huh. And then last night, I watched Boss Bitch Fight <laughs> Challenge. I was blown away. I was like, okay, we got to get right to this. If you haven't seen it, folks, you have to. Literally just Google Boss Bitch Fight Challenge and sit back and enjoy what I think is one of the best responses to what we're dealing with with COVID. Tell, tell me a little bit more about how this came. And I got some some questions about the folks that were involved um well i had seen there were a couple other videos that were sort of of the same technique that were floating out there and i had been bombarded with them by friends that were like you're a stunt woman you'd love this which isn't always true for the stuff that i get sent but this one in particular i was like damn that's a really cool i don't know it just sort of moved me in a way and i recognized sort of a lack of um boob representation like there was <laughs> There was a, sort of a lack of women. There were women in there and they were badasses and the whole thing was dope. I'm, I don't. I mean, no disrespect to the originals, but um, I don't know. I just suddenly was like, I wonder if a bunch of my stunt girls would be interested in like doing an all girl one. And then I thought, oh, there's a couple of the actresses that I've worked with in the action capacity and they, and they would definitely want to be involved and at least invited. So I reached out to them and within a day, every single one of them had responded, which, you know, LA response times, <laughs> nagging, those things right. all go hand in hand most of the time. And that all just got back within a day and everyone was super pumped. And then it kind of was a bit wildfire. It was like, I was like, if you've got any actresses that you know that might be stoked and want to be, get on board and these actresses were just like, me, 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 I want to, I want to, fuck it, let's go, let's do it. And I was like, amazing. And it just sort of grew into its own ever extending sort of bubble of joy and asking <laughs> now in each sequence did they get to sort of hey this is what i'd like to do i'd like to throw a right cross or a hammer kick or i want to go backwards did they all sort of say this is what i'd like to do or did you kind of steer them in a direction as this is combo this of all of that yeah combo of all of that it was like some people had a really specific idea both the stunt got most of the stunt women i was like do your thing because the original plan was if I get all the stunt girls to to do their pieces, then we can slot the actors in between and we can kind of give them some guidance based on the tails and ends, um, tails and heads of the stunt girls' pieces. But it kind of ended up that I, I ended up delegating sort of like if this actresses came through, say, Kim Murphy and she had Cameron Diaz and a couple and Caitlin Olsen, then I was like, okay, well, you kind of deal with your little section and you, this woman, deal with that section, and then I'll just do whatever I need to do to piece it together. I, I end up in it three times because I was just like, okay, this we're missing a bit, so I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, it was incredibly entertaining, and I hope there are more to come. Is there going to be a part two and a there's part three? There's plans too. I'll tell you, there's plans. I have three other ideas that I would love to tackle in that in that fashion. Um, you know, world got really crazy. Well, it was crazy and got crazier and it's just been, I, there's been other things that have needed the world's attention for a little bit. And the joy of the first one was of round one was 
sort of how easily it came together and the organicness of it. And I mean, it was a lot of hard work for a week. We were slaving for it, but, but when you're slaving for something that feels that good, it's all good. And so if it starts to come together naturally like that, I'm, I'm here and ready and I've already got the plans, but I'm not looking to sort of force it. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Now, would you consider doing a bad boss car challenge using the exact same thing? Not, but that sounds. But dope. instead of sharing fists to the face, we're talking T-bones, well, we maneuvers. I did have a couple of conversations because of one of the pieces in the boss bitch thing is a golf cart hit, and I was like, "There's all I mean, there's all kinds of places you can go with that thing, right? Once you start sort of thinking about it, so." There's definitely room for a bit more of vehicular um, involvement in the <laughs> next installment. <laughs> well, again, thank you. It was incredibly entertaining. I've already watched it a few <laughs> times, and it, it was awesome. Anybody out there who is frustrated, like the most you know majority of us are, regarding COVID, take five minutes and 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 just enjoy it. It's awesome. Yeah, I know. I've been heard as quite a like people keep talking about how it's a release and how it made them laugh and made their day good, and I was like. That that's why I want to make another one is that you know. <laughs> I hope you do. I really do. Yeah. Um, Zoe, let's get into your background just a little bit. Now you grew up in New Zealand, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's quite all right. Um, did you did you had a martial arts background, gymnastics? Were you always athletic? Yeah, yes, to all of those things, kind of. Yes, I was always athletic. I was always so, looking for a tree that was a good climbing tree, AKA had good handholds and I could get all the way to the top. Those were the kind of my requisites. Um, I always like going fast. I loved my trampoline. I, you know, I would disappear into the forest for hours as long as I was back in time for dinner. So I've always been an athletic lifestyle person. Um, I, I have called myself a gymnast cause I was full time doing that since from between nine till about 14, 15 and then so, semi retired. So I would train, but not compete for the last two years. Um, martial arts, I, I have never called myself a martial artist. Um, I studied Taekwondo, which led me into Xena and screen fighting. And so if I'm a martial artist, if anything, I'm, I'm a practitioner of movie foo, but I've been surrounded by too many actual martial artists to ever claim that for myself. But, but I'm really good at faking just about all of it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a very humble answer, but, uh, I was involved in a in a movie where I had to do a fight sequence, and that was the first time I'd done that. And mm -hmm. I found that to be harder than an actual fight. It's very because not only are you selling it, but you're trying not to crack the guy's jaw and this and that. Yeah. And, and so it felt more like dancing, and I'm terrible at dancing. And God bless right. <laughs> the the guy I paired up with. He was pretty patient Five, with me. Six, seven, eight, yeah, yeah, right. It, it was awesome, but at the same time, absolutely, I I thought it was just a lot more challenging. Then if, okay, just go at it. Well, in my time, I've met many uh, amazing martial artists that, that just doesn't take to, you know, it's a whole mind switch and, and uh, perspective switch and your, your reasoning and your intentions are all different. And sometimes it's just hard to snap out of what you've been trained for, for years. And sometimes it's just, it's just a different skill set. And some amazing martial artists make terrible stunt performers and some incredible stunt performers mm -hmm just um, just not that like can't actually break a board you know because you we get paid to miss you know so sometimes it doesn't always add up that way but yeah it is a, it is its own art for sure well that makes sense because in a real fight your body position and your weight management and everything is based on an impact yeah it's where weird. you can't do that at least you can't do it very long and still have a job doing yeah. what you're doing yeah, exactly. <laughs> unless you're the actor and then people don't care it becomes the stuff. right then so i got yeah <laughs> <laughs> what what was the segue or what was the thing that took you from you know athletic and doing this and that to stunts was there a aha moment what did you stump stumble into it well kind of both but i mean mid stumble i kind of went aha uh -huh, you know yeah. but i did gymnastics got too tall and, and realistically too old to keep doing it um but I, and I knew I wanted to move into something that sort of incorporated all of my body and let me use my legs and my arms. And there was a little bit of performance involved. And kind of what was up for options was, was aerobics at the time, which was all the rage. And I just, like the thought of giving it one of these <laughs> just made me want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. Um, but then I found, then I started thinking about martial arts and, and I'd watch people doing patterns and carters. And I was like, well, that's kind of, you know, 
and throwing kicks and jumping and I was like, ooh, that could that could sort of tick all the boxes. Um, and I ended up at a Taekwondo school. Basically, it was like the first one I showed up at and I was like, I just have to say yes, otherwise I might I might just like move on and forget and do, I'm a bit like that. So I just said yes and that that was the beginning of, of that. And I would stay behind and watch white belt, I mean black belts train because honestly watching white belts train is pretty boring when you feel the parents, yeah. I guess, you know. <laughs> Um, and I ended up sort of making friends with a couple of black belts and I overheard them saying some stuff about being stunt people. And I was like, hold up a minute. Cause in my head, stunt people were like daredevils, you know, life risking evil can evil types. And I was like, Oh, I- I'm interested in, in watching that, but I, I like being alive and I like not being broken. And that doesn't really, that's not the appeal to me. But then when I found out they were basically getting paid to like fight and flip and perform, I was like, um, I'm pretty sure I was like designed for this. Like, I don't know if, and I'd spent the year before being like, dad, do I be a doctor? Do I go? Cause my dad was a doctor. My mum was a nurse. I'm like, am I going to med school? Like, what do I do? Like I was getting pretty good grades and I was, you know, but just aimless. And it was literally like the, the first time in my life I went, Oh, I know, I know what I want to do. And I, and I had no shame about saying, I think I'd be good at it because I really did think, I, you know, it wasn't a, there was no ego. I just, my body was like, <gasps> me, that, me, you know. And then I chased it until I got it. <laughs> Stunts can be a tough circle to break into. Is that accurate? Yes. Oh, for sure. Because it's it's nebulous. And I think that I don't, I only know breaking into New Zealand. Well, that's not true. I also had to break into America and that was quite a bit tougher, to be honest. But New Zealand because it was so small, the industry itself was so small. And so the stunt industry was quite small, very tight knit. Um, but because it was small, like if we suddenly had a female character on Xena and all our girls were working, mm-hmm. uh, all right, who do we know? Who goes, who does martial arts with such and such, or who knows a gymnast that could or how? And so there was a, you know, you could happen into it a little bit easier, I guess. Um, and then in America, it was, again, I kind of lucked into it because I I ended up on Kill Bill. So I was I kind of broke into the industry before I realized it or before anyone else did. That's not to say it was then easy because I had an injury, visa issues, and I didn't work for like two years because of it. And it was, so it wasn't clear cut, but I was kind of, as far as I know, maybe it's not true and just no one told me, but I think I was accepted pretty quickly. <laughs> they might also hate me and I just didn't know. <laughs> Did you have a mentor or maybe somebody that kind of took you under your wing and said, hey, look, this this is a crazy business. I'm going to try and help guide you through it without stumbling on some of the stuff that people stumble on. Did, did you have like a, did you have a Hal Needham in your corner? Well, I had, I had a Jeannie Epper who was sort of the female equivalent. She's been around since forever. She was the Wonder Woman stunt double back in the day. And the, the whole, how I know her is there was a documentary that was made and the subjects were her and myself. So I was the Xena double of the, modern day and she was one of the women of back in the day and so it was following the two different stories kind of um and she definitely was was very helpful in kind of just letting me know who's because you know you walk in i'm like am i meant to respect that person or or not and and are they someone that i should sort of bow down to or is that you know you don't know those things until you've worked with them and the system in america is quite different there's like associations which are effectively for uh, ferority fraternities and sororities that I had no experience with. So there was definitely a bit of that. I think the tricky thing, if I'm completely honest, is she was 65 at the time and she had been very relevant and prevalent when she was at a time that women were still fighting just to get the right to be on set. So her perspective of what I was walking into was quite different. And because she was in in the age bracket she was, she wasn't sort of working all the time and a lot of her connections were like the older generation stunt coordinators who are all legends but i had to i had to sort of navigate and figure out the new school which which is quite a different world you know well most recently uh you were coordinator for once a time once upon a time in hollywood Mm -hmm. and uh arguably you are at the top of the pyramid right now was that I mean, it's, it's incredible and it's awesome. Uh, especially, is it fair to say, is it still, or it definitely was a male dominated industry, but you were at the top of the pyramid now. Was, was that journey like, is it different now than it was even maybe a decade ago? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely different even a decade ago. And I think it's, I think like the lava's molten currently. So it's all shifting and the hotter it gets, the more, the more the changes start happening and the more that so it gets built into the, what the new norm is, but definitely still male dominated, definitely still um, having, having conversations that might not on the surface be as open as, yeah, do you think you're capable because you're a woman? But there's definitely the subtext of that. And I'm not paranoid about that shit. I'm not looking to read that into stuff. I've had a really fortunate sort of experience of being female in, in the man's world. But um, but it's definitely shifted a lot. And there's now opportunities coming up. You know, it's that we're in this really interesting time as women right now where it's like, and diversity in general hopefully is coming in this sort of direction that is the check yourself. Could it be a female? And if it could, why didn't you consider that? And now consider it and still make the wisest choice. But that should be a consideration that it never was before. It never, ne- there was no impetus to second guess just plugging a man in. Now, now you kind of have to have an answer if, if you don't, if you haven't done that, you know. I mean, that had to be incredibly frustrating coming through the ranks, and there would be an amazing opportunity for a female stunt woman, and they got a small male or something like that. It, it, was that going that, on until I recently don't... or? That's not such a thing now. I know. Good. I, I, yeah. Like, I think basically same thing as like having a white person double a um, person of color or having a man do what, you know, double a female. SAG rules state that you have to prove that you can't find a person of color that can do that thing or a female that can do that thing. So it will still happen but only under specialty circumstances, because otherwise you can just get really slammed, which is great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> how uh, how did the relationship start with Quentin Tarantino? And obviously it's been a very strong one because uh, four four features with Tarantino at this point, maybe I, even five? I, yeah. I think, uh, how many has he done all up? Nine. There were two before me, three before me. So six. That's if you awesome. Count, yeah, six. I should know that number, but I but I don't. Um, we first we first met. Actually, that 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 exact moment is in that documentary double there. You see when Quentin and I meet for the first time, which is like one of the most special moments to have captured for me. Um, but so he, I was in LA to hang out with Jeannie Emper, who I was talking about, and I ended up training at Bob Yerkes's house, which is a backyard, like this crazy stunt dream backyard that's like. Eiffel towers and airbags and trapeze and trampolines and, the, and I was <laughs> what you know and so I was in LA they were doing auditions for Kill Bill from what I understand or can remember I think Charlie's Angels can't remember if it was one or two but Charlie's Angels and like another one or two projects that were quite female heavy were already shooting so a lot of the women that would normally double the tall blonde white people were all kind of busy so Quentin was scrambling, scrambling to find someone. And I happened to be in LA and it was kind of like Quentin's assistant mentioned something to her, his, her friend who was a good friend of Amanda McKayley, who's the director of Double Dare. And somehow I think that like the stunt coordinator ended up coming. I can't remember, but I ended up at the audition just like, Hey guys, <laughs> what's going on? You know? And uh, really honestly, I was most excited about that audition because I couldn't wait to go home and make everyone buy me beers because I had auditioned for a Tarantino movie. I was like, I'm already winning. You know, that's like (laughs) never occurred to me. I would get the job. Um, Quentin was at the audition. That's where I met him. He's super hands-on. I think Uh, the Chinese fight team were okay with the way I fought and flipped and did all of those kinds of things things they were they were accepting I think they were fans of mine actually if I'm honest they were they were in support of me being the devil and Quentin I think was quite instrumental in that because he had a I'm not sure how much he cared that I have a sim there's similarities between Uma and myself and profile and stuff like that but he has spoken to really liking my attitude <laughs> because I had I had been at that uh, backyard that I was telling you about in the morning I just don't think I had registered the weight of what this audition was because I really didn't think I was in the running it will, I was just turning up for the experience of doing it you know so I had exhausted myself in this backyard and I showed up and I was like did the fight stuff and all of that crap fine and then they were like anything else you want to show and I was like oh yeah I just was mastering like my front full at the other place I was playing around with it so let's give that a go and I my legs were just 
shot. And every time I hit the mini trap, my legs were just like, Burr. killed my jump, killed my bounce. Ate shit every single time. But every time I ate it, I was like, wait, I can totally do this. Please, can I try one more time? I'm just going to try one more time. And I'd like giggle and run back and do I don't know how many times I did it. Never, never got it right. But somehow that fearlessness and joy of the process was kind of what made him go, that's that's my girl. That's what I want. So who knows? Like you can't, you know, you just got to go with it. Be you is kind of the kind of the, well, I, you know, I always said there's nothing that stinks worse than that business than desperation. So if you're going in sort of saying, I'll oh, screw it, I'll have some beers later, and then look at you now. I mean, you know, six six projects later. Yeah, and I think the old screw it was like, it certainly, I mean, I was, I gave it everything I had. Like I wanted to do my best ever. But the pressure for that to be right or good enough wasn't present that and I spent the rest of my life trying to figure out how to remove that because that's the biggest hindrance I think for so many of us I've got a quote from you um that I want to read and I love it and it's very applicable to what we're doing here on on the show mm. and the quote is feeling fear is a good sign that your survival instincts are intact yeah. you need to appreciate the dangers to stay safe yeah and it's a you mess. know you're you're at you do an inherently dangerous job for a living. Um, talk to me about your mindset, maybe before a stunt, before you have a team getting ready to do when you co you're coordinating. Mm -hmm. Just the mindset and the reality of, if this goes bad, it, it can go really bad. So I think I think it's kind of such an inbuilt, uh, habitual, created over years process that a lot of it is sort of unconscious for me, and I. I've realized over the years of being asked questions so, like in and around that, uh, that it's probably best that some of it stay unconscious for me. So it doesn't become the thing that I'm super aware of. And, but what I think goes on is the preparation is the key, right? Like if, if I've done this thing a hundred million times and I could die doing it cause it's at speed or at heights or whatever, but I've done it a hundred million times. Then I just go, okay, how do I feel about the height? How do I, if I know in my body I can do it, then it's a matter of going, okay. Then I just, I can't be thinking about what could go wrong. That needs to have been done at the beginning. If you've never done it, you need to workshop it. That includes like having the right kind of bond with your team. That doesn't mean you have to want to drink beer with them and like hang out with them. It means you have to feel comfortable putting your life in their hands and you have to know that they are aware that your life is in their hands. Those two things are in place. Then it's the equipment, the setup. All of that kind of thing is if I'm at a place where I know I could make that work with all the elements, including the people and the equipment and weather and temperature and all the crazy things that can come into that, then when it comes time to the performance, I have to feel comfortable enough that I know I can push that aside and make it about the performance of it. The second step is once the performance is important enough, then what I do feel the most is performance anxiety. So the fear comes in the preparation and you want to get to the point where you go, okay, now fear, you have to fuck off because I can't, I can't have you because you ruin my focus on everything else. So the focus switches into what I can be afraid of is not getting it right for the camera, for the director, for the, like I have to switch it into that. That becomes the importance. And once I'm in performing, which was a huge lesson from Quentin too, actually, was the like, if you are the character, once you're in that character, you're not thinking about the technicalities. You're not thinking about the what ifs. You're thinking about the why am I here and then why am I getting to where I'm going? And then once you get there, you stay in character until you hear cut. Then you go, holy fuck, was that close? That felt close. My God, you know, that's that all happens after. You know what's so cool about that explanation you just gave Zoe, is if I removed stunt coordinator and put navy seal platoon commander yeah. it is almost all the same thing it's right. the the best plan the rehearsals your attention to detail triple checking your equipment trusting the people around you that you're doing this with and then just going out and doing it and then when you get back it's the whoo crushed it let's go do it again i mean it, there's so many similarities in there which is yeah. why and the other thing just as you're even saying that is what the flip side of that game is so many times people get injured doing quite basic stuff rolling an ankle jumping off an apple box or doing some shit because there hasn't been the like 
get that, make sure this, think about that, and then put it in your body and then make, trust your body to do it. You're like, oh, fuck, I've done this a hundred times. So you, and that's when you roll an ankle doing something lame, you know? That's well, the, uh, you're absolutely right. It's uh, when we go overseas, anything less than 100% attention and focus is when guys get hurt and die. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, obviously it's, it's different in Iraq, Afghanistan than Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, we're getting shot at with bullets. You guys are shooting stuff with cameras, but so many of the same principles <laughs> in a life threatening career. Right. Very and cool. You know, I feel like it does apply and it can be applied to, and I struggle to apply it in all the areas I possibly could, but in, in not even um, death defying situations, but you know, even as an, as an actor, because for me, when I first started acting, putting my emotions out in the open was far more terrifying than any of the stunts I've ever done, period. But what I found is if I if I don't prepare, I'm self-conscious, I'm self-aware, I don't like, I'm, I'm not committed to being in the moment, I'm committed to getting to the end, which is when you stumble and you fuck up and it's not authentic. And so the same thing applied for me for acting, the same thing applies for me directing, like all of those things, I'm like, oh, that's how you can strip fear. Because so much of the fear is the unknown, right? If you can strip, that then you're like okay now it's just the fear of whether i can make the shit or work in the way that is best for everybody no That's it's funny you know I, I i agree there were times when i was beginning in that business where i would rather jump out of a plane skydive onto a ship and then go scuba diving than to try and do this damn lincoln commercial because yeah. i <laughs> suck at acting but all that other stuff I'll bring it but here oh. i'm in a 30 second spot Talking about a SUV, and I'm just like, I was horrified. Different kind of vulnerability. That shit, like... That's it. I got to ask you this, and I, I think you already answered your response to it, but, I mean, there have probably been some close calls in your career or near-death experiences. Do you reflect on it and try and learn from it, or do you compartmentalize it? Because if you think too much about that, it, I, I found in my career that can be another vulnerability. I can't. I can't think too much about what might happen. Continue, move on, compartmentalize. Not always the healthiest thing to do, but given your job, sometimes the sometimes the best yeah, sometimes the best thing to do given a certain occupation. Yeah, I mean I think what's happened I've had two knocking wood right now. I've had two what I would call injuries. I mean you get hurt and busted yeah. and sprained and bleeding and all that shit all the time. But that injuries like that stopped me. Like, if it stopped me, it's an injury. If it's anything else, it's just a boo-boo, you know. Um, but one was on Xena, and I bust my back. I just yeah. basically was on a wire and didn't – I was meant to lock off. I was locked off, and I was meant to come to the end like that. But I didn't right, – it was my own fault. The stunt coordinator was like, I don't think physically it could be fine. I was like, I reckon I could make it work. He was like, all right. I mean, I really didn't give him much option. And I couldn't because – laws of nature and physics are such and i'm only so good and i'm only so invincible turns out but i came i hit the end of my wire you know back to the ground so my hips stayed in the same place and my head and my feet wrapped underneath me and i fractured a vertebrae and my i couldn't feel my feet when they first let me down couldn't feel my legs and they crumbled so there was a whole holy fuck what if i can't work again switch to wait what if i can't walk again you know and the um onset nurse came over um medic sorry and he told me to try and stand up and I was terrified. And then the minute I would stand up and my leg worked, I was like, fuck it, let's go again. I'm good. And he was like, ah, uh, no, no, you're not. So, and the second one was on Kill Bill and I smashed my wrist. And that one was um, not my fault. I'll, 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 I'll give that to somebody else. But both of them were like, the Xena one, I learned the lesson. Like I went, tried to go back to work two weeks later. We had a fight with that to smash a chair over my back. And I was like, I'll be fine. I was put on two back pads. Turns out a fractured vertebrae hurt, hurts more when someone breaks yeah. a chair off. It just dropped me. I had like involuntary tears, you know, that I don't cry at work. I was like, and I wasn't crying, but my body was just like, Ugh. and the second unit director came up to me and said, you are important to us, but you're no good to us broken. And that I have carried with me ever since. The pain and the fear of that, I've tried to compartmentalize, but there was a time when throwing myself backwards, if I was moving forward and throwing myself backwards, my body would, I could feel my body wanting to fight me on it. I had to consciously remove that one. The Kill Bill one, 
actually threw me a little bit. It was like, because I was out for a year on that one. And oh, it was wow. a, like, that was an identity crisis. I was like, who am I if I can't do this? And then am I the person that receives a paycheck to put myself at risk? Like, is that, do I love myself if I'm doing that? And how does that, you know, it took quite a while to compartmentalize that one for sure, if I'm honest. But once I could compartmentalize it, it's not a, I don't have a physical fear now. It's more like if someone says they think it's physically not possible, let's try the basic one and let's then add to it rather than just gung ho it. And with the second one was even if someone's telling you they know what they're doing, find a subtle diplomatic way of double checking if you don't 100% trust them. Well, when you're in a day just job, you're kind of playing a game with your brain. Constantly. In, in, with regards to that. I mean, I think the reason why seals are so sarcastic and I saw the same thing on the set with stunt with the stunt guys is you're making all these jokes and you're constantly fucking with each other yep. to try not to focus on the fact that you're getting ready to do something really dangerous. Yeah. It, it's it's kind of a too serious all the way through. It gets so heavy. It's hard to yeah. pull out of that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of a per perverse personality defect, but it works. It works. And actually that has always been part of my process building up to it too is like right up until that moment you know the little bit before cameras start rolling I tend to be quite like ah, blah, 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 making jokes and farting and doing whatever I can to kind of like because also what what works for me is that if the whole set is like super intense and quiet then it's like oh god it's like I'm carrying everybody's stress like you guys relax and let me just carry mine you know so that's part of mine is like I feel much more relaxed when everyone is chill and upbeat you know that's not there are sometimes like the fire burn on once upon a time i don't i don't want people joking and being chill in the preparation for that because the preparation period is much longer before we start rolling cameras so i want everyone to be focused for a way longer period but up until then let's keep it you know light. keep it late i understand okay i've got a sentence i'm going to give you some options but i want you to fill or complete the sentence it is, I hate blank the most. And here are your options. I hate water the most, sky the most, fire the most, automobiles the most, or stairs the most. Oh, stairs. No brainer, right? <laughs> isn't, there a, isn't there a hierarchy uh, when you're the new kid? And it's like, all right, you want to get in stunts, you're brand new, you get to fall down those stairs 12 times. We're going to save the precision driving stuff for us. Maybe you can hop out of a plane. Is there kind of a hierarchy? There's definitely some of that, but it's less, at least on, on my sets and I and most of the sets I have worked on, uh, basically, if you're an intelligent person, you're not putting the brand new person in a technically difficult, highly dangerous spot. You're just fucking not. So basically the shit jobs are, you can be on set, but you have to clean the mats and you can be in the, you might be in the background and you have to do 10 hundred backfalls that no one will ever see for three weeks straight. But we'll, we'll watch how you handle that and we'll figure out how, you know, so it's a little bit more like that because stair falls, here's the thing with stair falls and such car hits and loads of them is, you know, A, I want someone experienced in those roles because shit can go very, very wrong on those. Also, they can be the more high paying ones. So you want to give those to the veterans that, are, you know, if someone's like, if I'm like, bro, I love you. You've been around forever. I respect you. Do you want to do this one? And they're like, fuck no, bitch. I want to keep my elbows safe. You're like, cool. <laughs> you do the next one. But, right. but the high paying ones is kind of the ones you reserve for. Um, yeah. The veterans and the, like, the, eight, the 18, the 18. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also for the danger purposes. Like I don't, I'm not throwing any, like my least favorite thing to hear from someone who's like, man, I've always wanted to be a stunt, man. I fall down all the time and I throw myself off shit and blah, blah. I'm like, that mentality is not the one I, I don't want that one on set. You know, like yeah. I'd be fun to watch you get drunk, throw yourself down some stairs, but I'm probably not going to pay you to do it. <laughs> Cause there's a <laughs> recklessness that I, the ability to switch into that same mode is what recklessness is, is good. But mm. recklessness is like damage. It's just, damage control warning for me i'm like Bleh. yeah well you need this up here working as well yes yeah has yeah. there been a stunt that you're like no not gonna do it couldn't pay me enough no not in my career yet i've always said though i hope if ever there is 
that that I have the balls to say no. I'm in a different place now, but yeah. up when you're like, you know, you feel like you have to say yes to everything, otherwise you're not going to get hired. And there's a sadly there's an element of truth to that. But I think for me too, I always had the approach that was like, I can tell this is going to shoot me straight into that tree. So instead of being like, this is fucked, I don't want to do it, or I'm going to tree, you rigged it wrong. There's a diplomatic way of being like, do you know what? I feel like if I go two feet this way, can we just try one? Because then I feel like I can. So you just learn ways to adjust it so it's not going to kill you and ruin the shop. <laughs> is there something that scares you? I know we talked about com compartmentalizing and once you're there, you're performing and, and let's do it. Yeah. Is there that, eh, I, you know, I'd do it if I was supposed to, but this is maybe the one that it's got me up at night. Mm, no, because I think until I'm a pro, um, until I'm sort of approached and faced with it, you know, someone might say we need you to roll down this mountain face, and I'll go, okay, cool. Can we go look at it? And then I'll look at it and go, fuck, that's gonna hurt. What's the best? Blah blah blah. So the process already starts happening. If I look at something, I'm like, I'm in. Like they're like, we need you to shut, jump out of a plane. I'm like, I I've never been trained to do that, so I'm not. I'll say no because it would be stupid of me to say yes. But or I'll be like, how much money and time have you got? Because I would fucking love for you to train me up so I can do that. That's a whole different thing. I have always said the one thing I would have trouble saying yes to as a female, because usually you're not wearing much clothes, is doing a stair fall down an escalator, you know, with all those fucking mm -hmm. teeth. Oh, sticking. that just sounds painful. Oh, just like do a stair fall on a cheese grater. But of course, nowadays, <laughs> we've got all kinds of different technologies. You can soften the edges and all the stuff. That, but back in the day, and especially in New Zealand, we were pretty, we were pretty old school to begin with. And there would have been like, if you can fit a back pad, good on you but here's, here's your negligee where you <laughs> i don't want to do elevators I mean, escalators yeah <laughs> when you're doubling um an actress like an uma thurman um what's that relationship like it's probably different from each one some of them maybe you bond with some of them are probably like i don't even really want to talk to you yeah. maybe all the above have you, yeah. you have you had some really good relationships and maybe some that you're like i can't wait till we wrap this um, I've never had a, I can't wait till we wrap this. I, it's honestly, even when they're, if they're a bit crazy and a bit diva, I, I fucking love that. I find that shit really entertaining. And I, and I, <laughs> and I, I've been kind of a people person. So it becomes part of my challenge is like, how do I win this person over or, or just how do I get to a place where she's comfortable enough with me so I can at least give her instruction in a way that she will take it. And I can slip pads and her pants and undies and under a bra and all the places that they need to go and have her be comfortable with that. Those are ultimately, how do I keep her safe and keep her looking the best in that character I can? Um, in terms of becoming friends and stuff, I mean, Lucy was my first, you know? Lucy was my first, Lucy Lawless. <laughs> yep. um, and she just set such a such a high bar. She's just, a, she was just so grounded and hardworking and no bullshit. And I, so I just expected that that's what, what, what all actresses were like. And it's not true, but <laughs> but most of them have been. I've found a way to at least make all of them enjoyable in one way, shape, or form. And you know, people have different people have, obviously have different personalities, but also people have different approaches to work, right? So some people don't like to be talked to while they're in character and they're trying to make sure that they can. So there's just a little bit. The biggest lesson was just don't take any of that shit personal, just keep them safe and keep them looking as cool as they can. and do you then do your half of the job and don't take the rest of the personal. So when you hear a superstar say, I do all my own stunts, what is a reaction to that? Like, uh, it's, are it's, you just beyond it at this point? Like, all right, whatever. Oh uh, yeah. To be honest, it doesn't, it doesn't really trigger any anger in me anymore. It's more like, it's more just disappointing. Like that disappoint. I'm disappointed in you and as, as a human that you feel the need to like, if I had a stunt double, I'd be like, I had someone who made our character so much cooler than I ever could. Who am I to say no to that? Like I, my, my responsibility to the character and the, the picture in large outweighs my ego of whether there's, you know, that for, and that's just me. But yeah, I can't, unless they've had a conversation with the stunt person and it's become a whole thing and it's an agreement, which whatever, that seems weird to me too, but fine. But, you know, I've had, like, Sharon Stone, I doubled her on Catwoman, and she was on, I think it was Oprah after that. And someone texted me, someone called me and was like, man, Sharon Stone just mentioned you on Oprah. And I was like, what? And I literally went back to watch it, 
And Sharon was like, and I had this amazing stunt woman, Zoe Bell, she blah, blah, blah. And I was like, like that for me, I I don't care if the world knows it, but my people already know it, right? Anyone who's going to hire me already knows that I did that job. But for her to say it just makes, it makes her look like such a cool, big person. Like just like that's big of a person to know. Well, it's just, it's given respect where respect is due. Yeah. She didn't have to do that, but she no. did, which is awesome. Yeah, Lucy was the same like that too. Just no no qualms about it. She used to do heaps of her stuff and then broke her pelvis and she was like, take it away, Lord. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I heard the funniest quote uh, back on Hal Needham, uh, who's just, anybody didn't know who Hal Needham is, kind of a just a legendary stuntman, um, passed away, unfortunately. But if you saw the movie um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, loosely based was Brad Pitt's character on Hal Needham. And Hal had this quote where Burt Reynolds said, hey, don't worry about it. I do all my own stunts. And Hal Needham said, you know what? If I had a dollar for every actor I took to the hospital that said that, I'd be a rich man. And I'm like, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, my, my biggest joke when I started acting was like, it's all right, guys. I do all my own dialogue. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. What is the key to longevity in this business? I mean like you said in this work you get hurt sometimes it's bad but to try and prevent that i would think is a lot of physical exercise flexibility what is your recipe for success i'm the worst person to ask for the stuff i always have been i no longer smoke which i'm glad to say but i used to smoke and drink and eat mcdonald's and not really work i was i was a horrible example so i i often didn't even do interviews because i was like i'm just going to be a massive disappointment to you so let's just flag it but you know, you reach a certain age, you're like, well, I have to maintain some stuff. But when I'm in that mode, I, because I am just naturally kind of um, energetic and athletic, I like it. My favorite way of staying fit is if it's built in and if I'm learning. So either built in, AKA, you know, if you're surfing or swimming or going on hikes and it's a time that you're passing, but you're also getting fit doing it or learning something. So I'm doing jujitsu or, gymnastics or some whatever the training is to improve a skill set because then I'm thinking about the skill set and I'm and I will make myself vomit training for that put me on a treadmill and I'm like I fucking hate myself I hate the world I can't think of anything else but how boring this is like I'm a real I need that other kind of drive to be involved so as much as I can involve include it into my life if I'm training for a movie that's my favorite like if we're in turn up to work, you've got 10, 11 hours just to train and become more, move more like this person and get in the wires and we need to start rehearsing these rigs and these are the fight choreography. Like that's my favorite jam when I'm, when I'm in there. But I, if I can't do any of those things, I still have to work out. And the ways that I can keep that most interesting is sort of, you know, interval training or so it's, if I can kind of, if I'm like 10 minutes, if I'm like 10 seconds here, two minutes there, 10 seconds there, then I'm like, bow, bow. And I can kind of go for ages. If they're like, I need you to just do this one thing for 45 minutes. I'm like, can't see that. I can't see that happening. <laughs> so like maybe five minute abs would be your kind of deal. Five minute abs. <laughs> no, I can do five minute abs. Five minute abs. And flexibility for me is key. I, like yeah. no matter what shape I'm in, flexibility is my best friend and Annika. With your background, your experience, your attitude, your energy, I would love to be in a future film that you were directing. Where is that something that is, it's getting ready to happen, it's on the horizon, you can't wait, you're waiting for the right project. Where are we at with directing? Because it's, no, it's a no brainer. Yeah, oh, th I, I appreciate that. It's, um, and good timing for the question, in fact. I, um, yes, I have before, covid before there was a whole so i had this chunk of time in my life like it started right in the middle of once upon a time and ended like basically at the very end of 2019 it was as if my life had been really really good and then everything that's really hard could happen just happened in 18 months i nearly lost my boyfriend then i lost my mum. then we lost the baby and it just was like boom 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 i shut down until probably about two months ago where I was like started to come out and I was like oh look the whole world slowed down I could probably manage this <laughs> you know me come out of my shell and in that time the the boss bitch fight thing happened and that kind of generated the like I had been directing commercials and I had gotten to D, uh, DWW AFI directing and I had 
brought on a manager to manage me as a director. So the wheels were already there. Just then I just came to a screeching halt. So just in the last two months, I think Boss Bitch kind of lit the fire under me and further out. So there's now, at the moment, I was just writing them down before because it's getting a bit like what in my head. Um, there's like four features that are floating around at different variations of ready to go or not ready to go, COVID related and or still in development. Um, there's a TV show I'm working on. Uh, a music artist reached out to me after yeah. the Boss Bitch thing and was like, can we collaborate on a music video? And I was like, fuck yeah. So it's all, the the juices are flowing and the wheels are starting to turn and it's, um. And I just signed with an awesome, amazing agency that I think is being announced later, so I probably shouldn't say it now, but I feel like I've got a great team, which I've never had that experience. I've always had this weird relationship with representation where I think I've felt sort of apologetic, like, I don't know if I'm a real actor, and but then also, like, I'm meant to be the boss, so I've had this weird, I felt, you know, it's just been unpleasant, and I just think I know who I am in this business now in a way that I yeah. never did. I feel like an adult in the business, finally. And uh, I know who I want to surround myself with. And I'm just, I feel like I'm right on that precipice of that next step. And I'm feeling um, relaxed about it rather than. Well, um, I mean, I, I think it's honestly, <laughs> I think it's a no brainer based on your skill set and your experience. And I'm looking forward to seeing directed by Zoe Bell. If you need a former Navy SEAL that's got a few skills, yeah, uh, give me a ring. That'd be awesome, though. Yeah. Um, what uh Come on. what would you Come do different if you could go back 20 years is there anything other than that uh xena yeah impact <laughs> yeah no so 20 years that's an interesting call actually because i got to la i think it's 2001 or something so it's 19 years but um so i'm going 18 sure. years but i feel like i can take the liberty but at the end of Kill Bill, when I had the injury, I was sort of offered by the production, like, we can either send you home and pay for your rehab. And, you know, I think they were going to keep me on payroll. I don't know if that's an American, mm. please don't sue us kind of a situation or what, but I never would have. I was just, you know, so we can send you home and kind of reimb and reimburse you and rehab you there. Or you can come, we'll just keep you on with us. I mean, I was in a cast and I couldn't work or whatever, but I was like, shit, no, I want to be here till the end, period. So I did, got to the end of the film. Then it was a matter of, do I go home after that? And it's, it's kind of convoluted, but very clear in my head that the decision I made to stay in LA was based on fear of the door closing behind me, the opportunity of breaking into Hollywood, going away. So the decision to stay was based in fear, not in what's best for Zoe, what feels right, what do I know is going to feed me better, a.k.a. I'm a family. I, my family means the world to me and my friends are family. So, like, going home to that support, my dad was a doctor. I knew that there was a – I would probably get – I knew I could get really good um, care over there. But I was so terrified of, like, missing this dream opportunity. And it was not – it was more of – I was more worried about – fucking it up for everyone else that was like riding this wave with me and I got and I look back now and I'm like that year was fucking depressing I didn't know who I was I didn't know what I could do I didn't so it's sort of for me that was the big and I felt quite resentful towards LA for a long time like I felt trapped in a shitty relationship that you kind of started yourself so you can't really get, that's kind of what I felt for a long time and so advice to younger people and myself if I was younger and myself moving forward is like just check if your decisions are being made from a place of fear and if you recognize that they are just ask yourself if that's what you want to be making it based on or not you know because usually that's not well that's perfect you just answered my best. next question about giving advice to somebody who's breaking in would you would you oh. <laughs> would you agree <laughs> with the statement I believe is Sam Jackson he said I love the work I hate the business Yes. I mean, yes. Yep. So I hate the business of the business. My best friend said to me once, my oldest friend, Sophie, she's she's in England. We were born like five days apart. I literally was put in her cot the day I was born. So I've known her since the day I was born. Said to me on the phone, she was like, you know, what's really interesting is it's like you were made to do the work you do, the physicality, the performance, the being involved with people, the entertaining, the storytelling. She was like, 
but I can't imagine anyone less suited to live in like Hollywood tinsel town. And I was like, it was, well, it was such a relief too. I was like, oh, that's what the problem is. But it was like made so much sense when she said it because I, I would give myself a hard time. Like, I'm sure this is what I'm meant to be doing, but I'm fine. I'm really kind of unhappy. What is that about? I don't know. Just when she said it like that, I got to separate the two and it made a, it made a world that's of difference perfect. for me moving forward. Zoe, that. we do a little thing on the show mm. called the hypothetical survival world. Have you been told about this? Yes. Okay. Yes, well, this basically so what I'm this is, <laughs> is I'm going to drop you right into a life-threatening situation. And you're going to have options on what you're going to do. We're going to give you 10 decision-making points. This one results in me surviving or dying? Is that Well, that... it depends. We have a point system. So for every, oh, right, okay. every right answer or yeah. option, you get 10 points. Okay. For every wrong one, it's minus 10 points. So a perfect score would be 100. So you get a chance to be on the podium and we'll see what happens. Are you ready for your hypothetical survival yes, scenario? Hypothetically I'm, hypothetically, I'm ready. Okay, here we go, Zoe. Hypothetically, you are one hour into a flight heading down to New Zealand. Ugh. And all of a sudden... You see the captain coming out of the cabin because he needs to use the lavatory. And they've got the little drink cart set up. And just as he opens the door to the lavatory, three men hop up. One jumps over the drink cart, gets access into the cockpit, slams the door. The other two step up and they have knives. How they got them on, nobody knows. So you've got one in the cockpit, two standing in the aisles, yelling at everybody, Stop what you're doing. Here is your first decision. You are sitting by the window. Do you stay at the window seat or do you bump over to the aisle seat? Aisle seat's empty, I'm assuming. I'm not just that like is correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not shoving somebody <laughs> into the aisle. So yeah, you have you have an empty row. And so you can stay put in the window or you can bounce over to the aisle. I feel like I, I feel like there's some reasoning that I don't know, and now I'm trying to work it out. Well, think about what you might want or have to do next. Well, the two things that pop up for me is if I am going to act, I would rather be closer than far away. The other thing that pops up for me is if in some way, shape, or form, and this is like some little paranoia thing I've had since a little girl, is if that window gets fucked in some way and my body gets sucked up against it and all my guts get ripped out. <laughs> Um, if I was ballsy, I would probably move to the aisle seat. Okay. Is that your answer? I hate this game already. Oh, you're loving it. You know why? You already have 10 points. So stick with it. Your okay. instincts are good. Uh, okay. and this is the reason why, as we all learned from, uh, 11, you don't just sit back and let a hijacking work itself out. You need to step up. So if you're that much closer if and when you decide you're going to have to take actions, being in the aisle and ready to move is going to make you a lot faster in responding. Yeah. So congratulate. Like look, look, look like less of a dick who are trying to save and you're like trying to climb over. Re exactly. You get, <laughs> got the tray in the way, spill your drink. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Out of the gate. Perfect score of plus 10. Okay, here we go. Now, this just went down. There's chaos. People are screaming and yelling. You're sitting there in the aisle. Are you going to go? Oh, and P.S. The air marshal who was on board, they subdued him and they have his gun. So you've got two guys in. The, no, there was one air marshal. So oh, they've subdued the air marshal. Sorry. Yeah, correct. So in summary, somebody gained access to the cockpit and they shut the door. You have two guys in the main cabin. One has a knife and the other one has the gun from the air marshal. Are you going to go ahead? Are you going to engage them? Or are you going to wait and see what happens, see if the dust settles a bit? I mean, I personally would probably wait a second so I could sit, read what's going on and figure out what where I might have an advantage. And stick with that answer because that's the okay. correct one. Right. In a situation like this, the early stages, the early moments of it are absolute chaos. chaos. Yeah. And so maybe not, short of somebody is literally shooting directly at you, right. sometimes time can be your friend. And in this situation, time will be your friend. Let the immediate chaos settle down and 
you're able to come up with maybe a better response or a better plan with a little bit. Then you're planning rather than just reacting, right? Exactly. And in this situation, since you're not being shot at, you're, you know, you have a little bit of time plus 20. Okay. You have formulated a plan. The people around you were all, okay, we're going to do this. It's going to be a let's roll moment. Now, do you try and come up with some improvised weapons or given your experience with martial arts, are you going to go ahead and I'm just going to go hand to hand and do what I can in that situation. So improvised weapons or I'm just, I'm charging full speed ahead, hand to hand and trying to take I would improvise. Out. I would improvise weapons. Absolutely. And there's some great examples of improvised weapons just within arm's reach. A lot of people don't realize this, but you can take a magazine, roll it up real tight, and it's almost, you know, it, it represents a mallet or a stick. Um, the great thing about the f- inflatable seat bottom cushions, mm-hmm. that's a perfect shield, especially when you're going against somebody who can stab you. You have that distance in between you, and then, you know, you can counter. So you might be able to kick ass, and I know you can, but you are improving your odds. You know the deal. If you get in a knife fight, the person that bleeds the least is the winner. Yeah. So you are still a perfect score plus 30. <laughs> All right. You guys have done it. You've attacked these guys. Um, in the scuffle that ensued, one of the passengers was severely wounded. He's got a major gash. Now, in the middle of this scuffle, are you going to try and help that passenger out with the bleeding or are you going to completely subdue the two hijackers first? Completely subdue the two hijackers first. Absolutely. So in Sorry, SEAL buddy. teams, no, that, that's just it. Press and hold. I'll be right with you. That's what yeah. Is. Like in the SEAL teams, you have to address, okay, you might be in a firefight and somebody goes down. Well, if you go to help that person, that's two people not reacting to the firefight. You got to yep. secure the situation first. And then you can deal with any kind of injuries. And the SEAL teams, if I got shot, I would, we call it self-aid and then buddy aid. Let them continue to do what they're doing. I'm going to take care of myself, try and patch it up. And then somebody might come and help me out. So, geez, plus 40. You sure you didn't get a cheat sheet on this one? Because you're (laughs) killing it. Well, I have been in this situation before. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) That's a whole other story. All right. So you have subdued these guys. Do you keep them in place right there in the middle of the cabin? Or are you going to try and move them to the rear of the aircraft? Two people subdued. Leave them them where they're at or try and put them in the rear of the cabin. My instinct is to leave them where, A, where I can see them. If I've subdued them enough, where I can see them and... uh, I feel like if I've subdued them, I don't want to fuck around. Well, in this particular case, you're probably better to isolate them away from the passengers and specifically get them as far away from the cockpit as possible. So you're creating a distance, uh, which is creating a buffer. Um, This would be a great opportunity where people can pull belts off, ties off. Uh, You can lash their hands, lash their feet, go ahead and throw something over their eyes, throw something in in their mouth, make them very uncomfortable and then assign a few people that are going to be in charge of just watching them. So the whole point of getting into the rear is just building that gap of space, that buffer and isolating those two. So there could be an argument for both, but in this particular case, I would recommend, (laughs) recommend that's okay. We're still at plus 30. Okay. Next deal. So right now the plane is flying level. It doesn't appear to be doing anything drastic, but you have somebody in that cockpit and you don't know what their plan is, it probably isn't good, are you going to attempt to access the cockpit or are you gonna wait and try and see what see what plays out given the situation? Maybe maybe the pilot before he got, they, they entered the cockpit, maybe they put out a distress call. So is it, hey, we need to actively figure out about accessing the cockpit or wait? Um, as terrifying as it sounds, I feel like it would be worth trying, so we have the we have the captain out here. No, he. Uh, oh, they killed him. Yeah, they. He's he's a done deal. We don't oh. know the status of the other pilot okay. that's in the cockpit, but the one that came out to uh, take a leak, that was his last leak. Yeah, that was his last, <laughs> different kind of leaking. Yeah, he's he's got a red leak now. 
I'm th- I feel like waiting in that situation is sort of like, if, I mean, waiting for chaos to die down is one thing, but waiting, I mean, what if their plan is to fly into a building and you've got no idea until it's being flown into the building? So then the act now to get as much, the next thing I'm thinking is like, fuck, if breaking in there means that he kills the pilot, then who the fuck is going to fly the plane? But then I guess you figure that that's the next step. Dis- disable the dude that's going to fly it into a ah. building. Well, okay, so absolutely. Again, we learned that pre-9-11, you want to let people work out the situation. What are your demands? Do you want to fly to Cuba? Do you want a a case of Bud Light? What do you want? Post-9-11, it's up to us. Yeah. It really is. And so in this particular case, yes, we need to go ahead, formulate a plan for moving in to try and regain control of the aircraft. Congratulations, plus... 40 again. Okay. (laughs) The flight attendant is able to go ahead and punch in the code to open and access the cockpit. You now have the gun that used to belong to the air marshal that was taken by one of the hostages or the hijackers. I'm sorry. So you're going to go through this door. Are you going to try and shoot the remaining hostage that in theory is behind the controls of the plane, or are you going to just go ahead, get that guy, rip him out and try and remove them by hand? Take a uh-huh. shot, the, the, the hijacker, the third okay. hijacker. Um, are you going to shoot that individual as soon as that door opens, or are you going to physically try and rip them out and remove them from behind the controls of the plane? I feel like I want a knife so I don't smash a window, but if I've only got a gun, See, I don't know. You thought are process. Good thought process. Well, the I don't know about planes and guns enough to know that you know. You see in the movie, someone shoots it and the, the window smashes out. But um, <clears throat> if I if I wasn't worried about blowing a window out, I feel like I would just shoot him straight out the gate. <laughs> it's a risky move for a lot right. of reasons. Uh, yeah, if you miss depressurization of the plane. If you hit a control, a significant control, disabling the plane, your best bet in a close situation like that, close in situation, especially since you have other passengers, is just to physically go wrap that person up and rip them out of there. Yeah. 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 Uh, And again, uh, because of all the different high risk hazards of potentially using a gun. So uh, we're back at plus 30, but we're we're motoring along here. All right. So... Here's so the situation. Because for me, you see people using guns and planes all the time, and I've always been like, I feel like that's a fucking terrible idea, but I've never worked on that. Yeah, it really is. I mean, a plane that's pressurized, <laughs> you've got wings that are full of fuel. It's not a good combination. It's like a terrible idea. Okay. <laughs> I've been in movies too long. This is what I have. <laughs> All right. So here's your decision. You look over, and the co pilot is really hurting. He's conscious, but Does he's kind of. I've got the guy out. Yes. Yeah, so the co-pilot is kind of a mess. So here are your options. Obviously, that third hijacker that you just ripped out of the seat has the ability to fly a plane because he was. So do you put him back in there, maybe at gunpoint, tell him what to do, or do you remove him, put him back with your his buddies in the rear of the aircraft and sit down and take over the controls of the plane, not knowing if you have any flight experience? Can can the co-pilot speak? A little bit. He's kind of incapacitated, though. You can tell he's he's hurting. He's bleeding out. If I've got him at gunpoint and I'm not meant to shoot in the plane, that seems counterintuitive. I have no idea how fucking hard it is to fly one of those planes. I feel like that would be a terrible idea to put me in those controls. But if this dude next to me could coach me, I'm a pretty good learner. Yeah, I mean, the co-pilot's sort of, he's he's going to be able to communicate with you on a limited basis but he's hurting i feel like i just need to get the bad guy incapacitated in a way absolutely remove the source of the problem from the source get him yeah. back there with his boys way too many unknowns no it's um, not gonna make that much difference to him yeah i mean these big jets have an amazing autopilot that can almost do everything until the last 50 feet of, of a flare or of a landing so Congratulations, plus 40. 
You are sitting behind the controls of a 747 right now, but you didn't imagine that had happened when you woke up in the morning. And you have to Wait, decide. Ask me this. Sorry, I'm segueing. Why do marshals have guns if guns are such a fucking bad idea that fire up in the sky? Well, because those guys are so highly trained that it basically, is. in order to become an air marshal, you have to be able to shoot a silver dollar at like 20 feet. Okay. So they are oh, I feel considered, yeah, they're considered <laughs> precision shooters. And okay. so that is the reason why. Unfortunately, this one apparently was sleeping on the job and yeah. they took his handgun from him. Too many Bloody Marys. Yeah, exactly. I don't think he's going to get uh, the Christmas bonus. Mm -hmm. All right. You're behind the controls of the plane. Do you yes. concentrate on just, hey, I just got to concentrate on flying this thing? Or are you going to try and establish some form of communication? with the ground, with the tower, maybe another plane. Focus, uh, on, fo yeah, focus on flying or trying to establish some communication. I think communication. I feel like I need as much help as I can get at that. Absolutely. Somebody needs to know if yeah. the co-pilot wasn't able to do it, what's happening up here? What are we well, doing? And co-pilot fucking kicks the bucket. Yeah, well, exactly. You're, you're behind <laughs> the controls. What do I do here? Yeah. Which takes me right to the last question. Okay, you were at 50 points. You're doing great. Okay. You establish communications. They talk to you about uh, autopilot. They go ahead. They've programmed everything. So like I said, this plane will go within about 50 feet of altitude of the landing all by itself. But then you're going to be required to do the flare. Think about slowing it down, the brakes. Or... Do you try and get the co-pilot who's hurting into his seat for him to try and perform this? He's in and out of consciousness. It's kind of a crapshoot. Do we get a guy who's in and out of consciousness that's trained to do this? Or do I go based on the advice I've been given from the ground and try and land this thing? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm in contact with someone, I would say that I was probably better equipped to be conscious during this process than the co-pilot would be. And I agree. And because you're confident and you're good at what you do and you've been doing it for a while, absolutely. <laughs> somebody, somebody like you who's used to attention to detail and danger and, and doing things right, you would have an incredibly good chance of getting that plane on the ground stopped and everybody alive by somebody yeah. who's in and out of consciousness. Yeah. Zoe, congratulations. You're a plus 60. You crushed it. You are still alive. You did a great job. Still alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Zoe, we do something on the podcast called an after action report. What did you learn, if anything, uh, during this time we've had together? Anything about um, I definitely learned that. Um, well, I learned this lesson a hundred times. Is like, if you've got an instinct, just fucking trust it. Because if not, then you like, I knew I shouldn't use the gun. But it's really, I learned also that that is, true rather than just my instinct so that's good to know um i also learned that um that, a, that one of those big planes has got the kind of technology that in an emergency if i get some kind of con, um, communication and there's someone who knows better than i and they trust me to do it then i'm then i should trust me to do it which is true for most things in life actually to some degree well, you did great. You did awesome. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been an incredible interview. I've learned a, a lot. Uh, I, I mean it. I can't wait to see directed by Zoe Bell because it's, it's just a matter of time. You're a perfect fit. And um, I got to ask you a favor. You don't have to do it. But in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when you told Brad Pitt to get the fuck off the set, can you throw my name in there instead? <laughs> <laughs> you want the whole thing oh you can just do the real quick and dirty abridged version of oh no i mean do you want your whole name in there oh you can just say Cade. just say Cade. um well do i even use his name i don't think you do but um again it's a favor <laughs> uh okay what is it oh my god something like Cade, get your costume off Get your shit and get fucked. You made my week. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Bell. Um, well, hey, hey, folks, if you have friends, family, coworkers, people you care about, please share this with them because our entire mission is to try and save lives. Um, you can subscribe at uh, 
Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, folks. So you can be a survivor and not a statistic. Zoe Bell, I cannot thank you enough. That was an awesome interview. Thank you so much for your time. Can You Survive This Podcast is a Cavalry Audio production recorded live from The Bunker in Denver, Colorado. Hosted by me, Kate Courtley. Produced by Brandon Morgan and Kate Courtley. Associate producer is Jeff Apple. Executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. When the public health crisis known as COVID-19 hit our nation back in March, the Gary Sinise Foundation mobilized quickly to launch the Emergency COVID-19 Combat Service. This national campaign supports medical professionals, first responders, service members, veterans, and all of those who so courageously...